Strategies, those strategies for living, don't we? Boy, we do. <laughs> Some days more than others. Yeah, absolutely. But you know, I think we've got a pretty good life strategist lined up today to help uh, us with this. I agree with you. Folks, are you ready for your <laughs> daily dose of radio rehab? I certainly hope so, because uh, like Lauren says, we do have a wonderful life strategy today. Welcome. Welcome into 101.7 FM, 710 Keel. Welcome into... This edition of Strategies for Living. I'm Dr. David McMillan, and she's psychotherapist, PLPC Lauren Leon McMillan. And, uh, you know, I can't even imagine uh, what our life strategist had to endure today. He is Alan Townsend. And a decade ago, Alan's family received not one but two two catastrophic diagnoses. His four-year-old daughter, uh, Neva, um, and his wife, who was also a scientist, uh, her name was Diana, Mm -hmm. developed unrelated, life-threatening forms of brain cancer. Wow. And he had to witness his daughter's fight with cancer Mm -hmm. during those courageous last final months of Diana's life. Um, So Alan's a scientist, uh, but you're going to hear today as we talk to him, he was irrevocably changed. He began to see scientific inquiry not only as a source of answers to any given problem, but also as a lifeboat. Um, And and as we're going to talk about it. A sort, he even saw science, see science now, I think, as a source of spirituality and creativity, uh, a lens on the world that could help him find peace uh, with the reality, um, painful realities that he couldn't change. Yeah. And um, the it was a wonderful book that he's written called This Ordinary Stardust. We're going to talk about it today with Dr. Alan Townsend and uh, talk about going from grief to wonder. Mm. Folks, thank you. Thank you for tuning in. Thank you for being with us here on Strategies for Living. And uh, we appreciate our sponsors making it possible. The Robinson Film Center and Isaiah Cleaners and Pintail Roofing roof, roof. and Learning RX and Empress Cannabis with Love and the Shreveport Little Theater. Back in a moment, we'll meet Dr. Alan Townsend this ordinary stardust today here on strategies for living come back and join us hey let's talk about the robinson film center 617 texas street downtown shreveport how many times do i say there is no place like robinson film center you don't say it enough well i probably don't and there is no place like the robinson film center i mean you know uh, where do you go to see uh, current movies that you're not going to see any place else. Well, Robinson Film Center. Find out what's showing at uh, robinsonfilmcenter.org. And then you've got Abby Singer's Bistro, right? Full-service bistro and bar, second floor of the Robinson. That's what oh, I can't get oh, enough of. Oh, man, man. So, you know, here's what you want to do. You want to join the crowd, join the fun, become a member. You get discounts on movies. You get concession upgrades. You get bistro deals. RFC, 617 Texas Street, downtown Shreveport, robinsonfilmcenter.org. Reading begins not in the classroom, but in your child's brain. I'm Donisa Walker with Learning Rx Shreveport. If your child struggles to read, maybe he or she has trouble focusing or comprehending, Learning Rx Shreveport offers a science solution to reading problems. Working one-on-one with your child, targeting his or her reading skills. Today, call Learning Rx Report. Make an appointment to have your child assessed. I know you want to help your child. So does Learning Rx Report. And welcome in. Welcome into 1017 FM and 710 Keel. Welcome into Strategies for a Living. Lauren Leon McMillan, David McMillan. Let's welcome into the program now Dr. Alan R. Townsend. 
Dr. Townsend is a scientist, he's an author, a speaker, and dean of the University of Montana's W.A. Frank College of Forestry and Conservation. He is a highly cited author of more than 140 scientific articles. He served in multiple prominent leadership roles. He was named an Aldo Leopold Leadership Fellow and a Google Science Communication Fellow and was one of six scientists chosen to be in the Let Science Speak documentary film series, which premiered at the Tribeca TV Festival September of 2018. He lives in Montana with his family and two ridiculous dogs. (laughs) Dr. Alan Townsend, welcome to Strategies for Living. Yes, welcome. (laughs) Thanks, David and Lauren. It's really nice to be with you. Two ridiculous dogs, huh? (laughs) Yeah, we we understand that one. We can relate. (laughs) Yes, we can. Um, Okay, so um, Dr. Allen, you are a biogeochemist. (laughs) That's a mouthful. Biogeochemistry. Um, yeah, I got to start here. <laughs> what, what in the world is a biogeochemist? <laughs> yeah, um, <laughs> a mouthful, right? Yeah, um, yeah. As, as I joked with someone in the past, it's a kind of science for someone who ha- can't decide what they want to do. <laughs> um, what <laughs> what it what it really is is it's been my job to to study the elements which form life. Mm-hmm. And um, all of us, every every living thing on earth is built out of 20 or so different elements. And they not only build life, um, those elements cycle in between us and our own bodies and anything alive and other parts of the world. Um, and so that's what I do. I, I study those connections, I study those cycles and also how human beings have changed them both to our own benefit and also have created some environmental problems for us. That's that's been the core of my job. I can hear the relation to the title there, this ordinary stardust. Yeah, (laughs) yeah, really. That's right. Hmm. What a a wonderful title and talking about life. My goodness, how your life changed with just a handful of words a few years ago. Uh, You actually... And the book is called This Ordinary Stardust. You talk about this in the book. You actually got, you heard words that no parent wants to hear several years ago. Um, your little daughter um, uh, was diagnosed with uh, brain cancer. And she yeah. was, she, Neva was actually diagnosed before Diana, your wife, right? That's right. Yeah. Yeah, it was, um, as you might imagine, that was a pretty tough day. Um, I can't, I can't imagine Alan. Yeah. We, we, we had, we certainly knew that, that something wasn't right. Um, she had developed symptoms over the preceding, oh, I'd say three to four months that became clear. She wasn't, she wasn't really growing and developing in some ways that the way her peers were. And it wasn't, it wasn't completely obvious, but it started to become clear. Uh, and then she started to get headaches. And so we, we knew something was going on, but, but still that's, you know, what, what actually emerged was, was very low odds and not what we expected. And, um, so that was, that was a pretty shocking day. Yeah. Now, um, it's interesting because you and I talked, you and I and Lauren talked briefly yesterday. Yesterday yeah. was an important day <laughs> for, uh, <laughs> Uh, for Neva, wasn't it? <laughs> it sure was. It was her 15th birthday. Wow. <laughs> so <laughs> I hope you had a wonderful celebration yesterday. We did. It was, yeah. it was a nice day. <laughs> oh, thank you. How long after Neva's uh, devastating diagnosis did, um, did things begin to develop where you knew something, you guys knew something was going on with Diana, your wife? It was just over a year. Mm. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. Again, yeah. I can't even imagine what that was like. How did, 
what how did that develop how what 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 transpired so that one um was i mean obviously it was utterly unexpected as you might imagine and she was a she was a kind of absurdly healthy person i mean she she ran constantly took great care of herself all those things right and yeah, um, yeah. very very fit very healthy person and we the first sign of it we were actually on a trip we were in costa rica and she she just was noticing pain in her hand um and we thought it was just a repetitive motion thing, a carpal tunnel or something, because, you know, was, she was a scientist as well and did a lot of writing and was on, was uh, the first thing I remember was watching her on her computer and watching her kind of keep shaking her hand. And um, mm -hmm. so we didn't worry too much about it, but it got a little bit worse and she went to see a neurologist. And I remember her saying that he was a little vague, but, you know, wasn't terribly concerned. And, they scheduled a follow-up MRI for a couple of months out, so nothing urgent. And just said, "Well, let's we'll see if something's going on here." Right. Um, and it all changed on one day where, um, in and I do write about this a little in the book, but she she got up one morning and was was in the bathroom, just kind of doing a routine thing, trying to put a little medicine on her face, and and basically her her brain was telling she thought her her left hand to to reach out and grab something as she normally did, but instead it was her right hand that did it and was just kind of waving around in the air, nowhere near the object she was trying to grab. And so that was a, that was obviously a pretty scary and unsettling moment for her. And then for me, and um, that changed things in a hurry. And um, they, they, they moved up the MRI to that evening. And, and then we got the diagnosis that she, she actually had a pair of quite devastating tumors in her head, uh, a form that, that almost nobody survives. Mm. You know, I, I think you say science has always been personal to you, hasn't it? Um, but what you're yes. describing, I guess it got very personal in a very different way. Almost, well, over the course of a year, but then with your, your wife, it, it very quickly. Talk a little about that, Alan. Yeah, you're right. In in that it, it was my job and I loved it. And so it's very personal in that sense. But I would say that prior to Neva's diagnosis and all this happening to our family, it was, you know, it was a bit more distanced and abstract. And and suddenly, you know, when, when the people you love most are, are facing something like this, and you're a scientist, I guess, I mean, I under, I understand, I understood how to how to read scientific studies, how to mine through data, how to do all those kinds of things. And, um, but it became something where I desperately wanted to find answers mm. in that. I wanted to find a solution to fix the problem that was before me um, in, a, in a personal way that I had not yet confronted. And um, so that, that changed it in, in a hurry. Mm. Yeah, you, you talk about Diana um, and... Um... Of course, she was a scientist. Also, what was her area of science? She she was what was known as an environmental microbiologist, and so she studied. She was a microbiologist, and so she studied all the tiny forms of life, uh, bacteria and fungi, and all these little things that are everywhere in our world. And and her lens on it was kind of how they exist in the natural world, and and what we need to know about that to answer all kinds of questions. And you you, you paint a wonderful. Uh, portrait of Diana in the book. Thank you. Um, you, you, am I remembering you uh, at one point said that she had all of this curiosity and, yeah. and no ego. Hmm. Am I remembering that correctly? Yeah, I don't, I mean, yes, on, on the former for sure. And, and basically on the latter, I mean, you know, we all have egos and she had her things, but she, but not much, right? And but her her curiosity was was pretty boundless and striking. And um, and as I write in there, I, I I have little doubt was was part of how she managed to live um, through that diagnosis and for the remainder of her life in, in some pretty remarkable ways. Hmm. Mm -hmm. Now, at the time, Neva, who was born in in two thousand nine. Uh, she was, uh, when she got that diagnosis, she was three coming up on four, right? 
It, Neva was four. So yeah, yeah, it was, she was born in 2009 and it was, um, just, just the, the symptoms started kind of soon after her fourth birthday in, in 2013. And so she was just a little over four years old when it hit. How in the world, Alan, do you, how do you tell a, 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 a three or four year old that they've got to have brain surgery? <laughs> Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I don't know that there's any perfect formula for that one. Um, You know, (laughs) you just face it head on. I mean, there's no doubt that we talked before about that day that you're you just you're just suddenly playing catch up. Right. I mean, everything, the world changes in an instant and all of these things start happening. And before you know it, you know, you've got to make this decision, that decision, the surgery is coming. And so you you're, you feel like you're running to play catch up the whole time. And yeah, um, what was I mean, Neva has a lot of her mom in her, I would say. I mean, what was pretty remarkable in hindsight is that not that it wasn't incredibly hard and, and in some ways very terrifying for her and aspects it was, but she's, she was remarkably resilient from it too. Um, the, the day, the day of her surgery, I think I write about this as well, but I, I'll never forget this. I mean, we went and spent the night near the hospital cause she had to be there so early in a hotel and Diana right. and I were just, we didn't, we didn't sleep. And, and, um, of course not, you know, we, we got there like five thirty in the morning and she just, you know, it's this tiny little kid. She just marches through the glass doors that she knew already. She, I think we go this way. And like, it's like we were going to <laughs> Disney world or something. It was crazy. <laughs> so she's, she was pretty tough. <laughs> uh, sounds like it sounds like, uh, uh, everybody was tough around you and, uh, you're a pretty tough guy yourself, Alan Townsend. The, this is a wonderful book. It is called This Ordinary Stardust. Uh, Alan Townsend is the author, and he's our life strategist today here on Strategies for Living. You can find This Ordinary Stardust wherever you buy books. It's a scientist uh, path from grief to wonder. We're going to talk about oh both of those things and much more as we go down this road with... Uh, Dr. Alan Townsend today. This ordinary stardust. Alan Townsend is our life strategist here on Strategies for Living. And we've got much more to learn, much more to come. So don't go away. Stay right where you are. Strategies for Living, coming back. You know, it's been going on for 101 years now. I'm talking about the Shreveport Little Theater. Been enriching our lives through the performing arts and education and uh, opportunities to volunteer service guided by professional artists. They've been at it a long time. And up next, beautiful, the Carol King musical is the summer musical this year. And have you, have you seen the 24, 25 season? My goodness. Neil Simon's Brighton beach memoirs, steel magnolias. It's a wonderful life. Doubt. I love you. You're perfect. Now change. And then May We All, a new country musical. You know, you need to get your season tickets right now. ShreveportLittleTheater.com. It is American theater at its best at 812 Margaret Place in Shreveport. Shreveport Little Theater. ShreveportLittleTheater.com. And welcome back. Welcome back into 1017 FM, 710 Keel. Welcome back into Strategies for Living psychotherapist PLPC Lauren Leon McMillan David McMillan and we're with Alan Townsend today the book is this ordinary stardust a scientist's path from grief to wonder you can find it at your favorite bookseller uh, and I hope you will what an incredible book mm-hmm. let's let's you did the grief for you um, <laughs> did that grieving start actually with Neva's diagnosis in a way, Alan? Um, Oh, that's a great question, dude. Um, I don't know on that. I mean, to some degree, yeah, I guess the answer is yes, right? Because in in the sense that in, you know, these were, Neva's tumor and Diana's were were very different things. And, And in her case, there was all kinds of danger and all kinds of worry, but we we expected her to live through it. Um, and, and the lot of the worry was about, 
the things that it would change in her life. Um, and, and for some kids who get to her particular form of tumor, it really does shorten their life and a lot of horrible things can happen. So, so there was a ton of stress, but I would say the grieving there was about the loss of normalcy for her. Mm -hmm. Right. The fact that like, you know, here's this kid and she's supposed to go through and do all these things. And suddenly, suddenly her life path is, it's very altered, and and we don't know the details yet. Right. We don't know what that's going to mean. Right. Um, so so yes, I think it in a form started there. Yeah. Through all of this, Doctor Townsend, how do you understand grief now? Hmm. Oh boy, big question. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, let me think about what I want to say about that one. I mean, the first thing I'll say is that. It, I think I wrote in the book, it's the most powerful force I've ever known. Yeah. And, and, yeah. Um, and, and, and I stand by that. I mean, it, and as a that's a, that's quite a, that's quite a statement to make as a, you're yeah. a scientist. Yeah. And we'll, we'll talk well, more yeah. about that, but that's quite a, that's, that's, that's quite a statement to make from a scientist. Yeah. And I'd probably get lots of argument from other scientists. Sure. You know, sure. But, um, but in, you know, certainly in terms of my own personal path through life, I mean, it, 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 it just, it, it can do things to you. It certainly did things to me that I never would have predicted and expected and has a way of, of altering your life in, uh, in ways that, that can take a long time to figure out um, how and why. And um, so, so there's that, right. Um, the other, the other thing I'll say though, and you know, for folks who may be going through their own or listening is that you can get through it. And, um, and, and there's, there's no way to the other side other than through it. Mm -hmm. Um, And just kind of meeting (laughs) it head on. uh, And Boy, I don't know. Um, a lot I don't know if you. I, I don't know. If, I don't know if you're a Willie Nelson fan or not. But I'm thinking. Of, I'm thinking of the Willie Nelson yeah. song, um, which it's is just... an incredible song. Something you get through. Mm-hmm. You know. Yeah. yeah. Um, I also love your your answer because I often talk with clients about how grief, if you let it, can be a great transformer. Hmm. Yeah. Uh, that, that's absolutely the truth. And um, I mean, it's, it's, it's obviously never something I ever would have chosen no. in a million years to, to have been faced with this in our family, but, but it has changed me and, yeah. and there, there, it has changed me in some ways that I'm very grateful for. Um, and there are, there are moments of extraordinary beauty in the middle of things like this that, right. that are worth taking in. You know, um, one of the things as psychotherapist uh, we do is we attempt um, to give people kind of a um, an a idea, a roadmap. And, you know, Elizabeth Kubler, Dr. Elizabeth Kubler Ross gave us, uh, actually, she formulated these as stages of death and dying. They've come to be the stages of grief, denial, and yeah. bargaining, anger depression, acceptance. acceptance. We call them the stages of grief. I've always had a problem with that because in my experience in working with, uh, you know, with clients through the years, you know, a stage is like a step. It's like, okay, well now I'm. So it it implies linearity. Yeah. yeah, It implies linearity. (laughs) It it never is. I'm through denial. Now I'm at bargaining and I'm through bargaining. Now I'm at anger. And it, it, that's not what I saw. That's not what I saw clients go through. I saw bouncing, you know, denial, bargaining, depression, back to denial. Back, you know, I, was that your experience, Alan, as you moved through what firsthand, what would you say about those quote unquote stages of grief? Yeah, I, I mean, I, I would agree with you. And I think, you know, Lauren, I heard you say it implies linearity. And mm-hmm. I agree it is. I mean, I suppose in some very broad sense, I mean, not to geek out and be a scientist, like you could, you could ultimately show your trajectory through all that bouncing over time, and it goes a certain direction, but it, it is, yeah. it is not a linear process at all. And, and one of the things that I think is common for folks that I've talked to, and certainly I experienced is that it, it, it hits you out of the blue in in when you least expect it right when you i mean in the beginning you're just consumed and you're just kind of there but but right. as time passes there 
they're just things, right? It's some, it's some particular memory. It's some, something you see, whatever it is, and you're kind of rolling along. And you, so to your analogy, David, like you might think you're several stages through it. And then suddenly you just get your butt kicked by just some little yeah. moment. Yeah. And, um, <laughs> yeah, that's kind of how it happens. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. I, in fact, I'm thinking of another Willie song, Yeah, you know, uh, there you are the combination yeah. of, uh, oh, the combination yeah. of something you get through and there you are. Uh, I mean, you know, I, I think Willie's the poet laureate <laughs> <laughs> of life in the 21st century. I don't know. Uh, <laughs> what do you want people to, I mean, you, obviously you poured your heart, Alan, into this wonderful book, This Ordinary Stardust. Mm-hmm. What do you want? Uh, and I, and I'm, I'm, I'm going to ask you, um first uh was it was it cathartic for you was writing this ordinary stardust a catharsis for you oh absolutely i mean it, it's um i mean it was it was really hard at times and yeah. to, to, to to write to write these things right to kind of pour your life out on a page and to revisit the memories in there but um you know the book the book started, I'd say, in, in well, it, it has has a couple of origins. The first is that um, I always, I mean, I always loved to write, um, but mostly my writing was in other, was in science and the rest. And I had started a, a blog before Diva got diagnosed that was that was just about writing short pieces mm. that were communicating science, the science I did to a popular audience. Mm-hmm. And the day that Diva was diagnosed. Um, I went home that night and I just I just wrote a piece about it and without thinking it was it was for me. I mean it was just a way to process a very very difficult moment in my life and without thinking about it much I kind of threw it up on the blog the next morning and and we ended up having a number of people respond to that and say you know it helped them to read it and so I mm-hmm. I got in the habit a little bit of writing these shorter pieces as our family went through the journey. And then fast forward um partly because of that I think and seeing that um Dana was a so she was she was many remarkable things but one of those was she's was, she's was incredibly generous and um really really cared about other people very deeply and so she asked me to write the book a few weeks before she died and mm. and and just said she said you know I want I want our story to help other people wow. so so that was <laughs> you know, <laughs> thanks a lot no pressure there yeah. right? but, yeah. Uh, yeah. but um but yeah um that's that's really where it started but to your question david i also she didn't say this but i i'm quite certain she knew it would help me too and that was part of why she asked yeah 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 well i think you honored her request in a in a beautiful way um and as i'm holding the book i can't help but marvel at the cover (laughs) i love that that yeah I mean, it's like it's you think it's upside down, right? But that's truly yeah. what you've done in this book too, is to turn, you know, grief upside down. Hmm. hmm. Yeah, that's that's nicely put. Um, and, and I, I love that cover, and I can say that freely because I didn't have a damn thing to do with it. <laughs> <laughs> and um, it, it, it's uh, yeah. I mean, so the folks at the publisher and the cover artist who, who came up with it, I, I think she did a brilliant job. Yeah. Yeah. Definitely. Hmm. The other thing that uh, I relate to personally is I actually, my background is in science before I um, oh, yeah. switched over to counseling. And so I I enjoyed reading and going through your, your wrestling, if you will, of science mm-hmm. and religion. Yeah. Um, can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, um, I can try anyway. And so... <laughs> It doesn't reflect all that well on the younger me, I would say, but that's okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, we grow. Um, we grow through grief, uh, right? Yes, we do. <laughs> um, I, you know, I, I I am someone who didn't grow up with any organized faith traditions. It didn't go to church. It just wasn't part of my life. Mm-hmm. And, um, and, I, and honestly, I didn't think about it that much one way or the other. I mean, when you're a kid, this is just who I was, right, and what we did. And I had friends who did, but I just it didn't think much. Um, it, you know, and as I as – I, got increasingly interested in science and pursued that in my path, I I had what I think I might refer to in the book at some point is, is a little bit of what feels now like a kind of scientific arrogance. And, and that's not to demean, demean science at all. It's it's what I do. It's one of the most extraordinary things out there. Right. But in the sense that I was 
I was very rooted in thinking that, you know, science could supply the answers to pretty much everything. And those who maybe searched through faith traditions for some of those answers in my mind were, you know, on the wrong path or, you know, a little soft minded or whatever. Right. And like, and, and that's just kind of where my head was when I was young sometimes. And, And that started to shift well before my family got hit with this, but, um, it was it, it was it was humbling and very illuminating to me just as a human being to as I went through this, you know, we talked earlier about, you know, science becoming very personal, um, especially when Diana was diagnosed and we basically knew that she was very unlikely to live that long through it. You're, you're desperate, right? You want mm-hmm. you want answers and you want to believe there's some meaning in it and you want to believe in some higher power that maybe can come do something about it yeah. um, or yeah. that maybe, or that maybe you can blame. Right. I mean, <laughs> yeah. Sure. And, sure. And, uh, and, and that just started to lead me down a path of more reflection, especially in time, you know, as I was writing the book to, to realize there are, there, there's so much commonality, obviously in all of us and human beings and, 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 and across in science and religion. I mean, they're different mm-hmm. things, of course, but they're also at a fundamental level about, you know, trying to provide answers for yeah. humanity, trying to provide a source of comfort, trying to f- provide paths forward that make our lives better. And so um, it, it really changed how I looked at it. Mm. We're uh, we're with Alan Townsend. It's an incredible book. We're talking yes. about uh, this ordinary stardust. You can find it wherever you buy books. It's a scientist path from grief to wonder. Alan Townsend with us today here on Strategies for Living, and we've got more. More to come, more to learn from Alan. Stay with us. Hi, this is Jay Merle for Pintail Roofing. Let's talk about quality. When you hire Pintail to build your roof, here's what you can expect. Quality and quality control are the most important concerns for us at Pintail, and you need to know that Pintail stands tall with swift and professional performance on any warranty call. This is our most important policy. And remember, we're your neighbors. We'll be here for you for the long haul. Our family's lived here for over 100 years, and we aren't going anywhere. On the commercial side of Pentel's business, our fluid-applied roofing solutions can save thousands of dollars over conventional commercial roofing options. Call Pentel at 226-ROOF for a free inspection of your home or commercial building. That's 226-7663. Pintail Roofing. What's the condition of your roof? And welcome back. Welcome back into 1017 FM, 710 Keel. Welcome back into Strategies for Living. Lauren Leon McMillan, David McMillan, with Alan Townsend today. Dr. Alan Townsend, his, uh, his book is an incredible book. Yeah. It's called This Ordinary Stardust. One of those special books, you know. Yeah, absolutely. A scientist path from grief to wonder. Over your career, how has science changed? Mm. Uh, how have you seen science uh, change evolve. over <laughs> your career, evolve and change over your career, Alan? How have I seen, like, science as a whole kind of changed? Yes, maybe? yes. Yeah, boy, that's a, a, a good question and, and a big one. Um it a few things come to mind i mean one one thing that i think we've certainly seen that is that is unfortunate um is that is that has little to do with science in some ways um it's just a growing polarization in society in terms of trust in science that you know other forces at work to divide us and how we look at the world for less than noble reasons um, have included um, uh, uh, undermining the trust in science. And, um, and that's, that's a, a reality in, in more recent years that, that I just didn't experience or I don't think was true when yeah. I was younger. Do you worry, do you, do you worry about that erosion, what you're calling that erosion of trust in science? How, how much do you yeah, worry about that? I worry a great deal about it because, um, you know, again, I think I write in the book at some point that, for anything, we shouldn't, we shouldn't demand perfection to give it our trust. And, um, if we do that in the world, we're, we're really in trouble. Hmm. Um, and the, you know, science isn't perfect. Of course it's not, it's a human system. Um, but it, it is a, it is, 
I mean, we're not talking to each other today without it, right? It is a source of so much of how we can live our lives, do live our lives, and need to live our lives in the future, and 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 boils down often to some really, really critical things around society. And so for 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 forces to be at play that that are undermining that trust, it just means that it means that bad decisions will get made um, that that harm people, and yeah. that's what I worry about. And what? um. And and we're certainly seeing more and more of that. I mean, we saw it in the pandemic. We're seeing it on several fronts. So that yeah, that's a concern to I think just about everybody who who is a practicing scientist. What do you think the biggest misconceptions are out there uh, today about science that need to be um, talked through, maybe even debunked, if you would? Oh, boy, good question. Um, You know, again, I think of a few. I mean, I think in the vein of what I was just discussing, there's, you know, there are a lot of folks who just feel that it is that it is biased, right? That it's that scientists who are putting forth answers, it could be about vaccines, it could be about climate change, it could be about a bunch of things are are bought and paid for, right? That there's, you know, that they're, what they're doing is is not is not honest. And it's, right. it's paid for by some dark money force of one kind or another. You know, and, and what's what the reality is, is like, very occasionally, that kind of stuff is true, um, you know, because they're human systems, but but in the overwhelming majority, it's just not. And um, that's a problem, right? That just, that's that basic distrust to say, oh, here's this here's this set of information that can help us make better decisions as a society. Uh, that's all BS because it was paid for by this, that, or the other. Th- that's, a, that's an unfortunate growing uh, belief among some. Hmm. The other that is maybe more direct to what I try to deal with in the book is this kind of just portrayal of science often as this as this very you know needs to be this inhuman unfeeling thing mm-hmm. <laughs> and that you know you to, to avoid that bias you have to strip all your emotions out you have to you know almost be robotic and yeah. the approach and, and that mm-hmm. that i think is also just utterly false um the the best scientists i know are really emotionally invested in their work because they love it and they really care about it or they care about what it's going to do for the world and and again, that doesn't mean that if you approach science that way, you're going to screw it up. Um, I think actually quite the reverse. Mm. How has your relationship with science changed through this experience? If, if at all. It, it has. Okay. Um, and so, you know, as you know, as you all even kind of brought up in the summary a little bit, I like many, I think I um I loved science. I did it, but I, I I saw it as a as a source of answers, right? A source right. of kind of you know a solution to this problem. How do we build a bridge? How do we build a new iPhone? How do we whatever, right? Like that's kind of what it was, and and definitely a source of wonder as well. I mean, that's partly how I got interested in the first place. It's like, oh, that's really sure. cool to right. understand that answer. But but that's where I would say that the borders were for me, and when I went through this. Um, again, without even thinking about it, I started to realize that some of my ability to get through the hardest times, some of the comfort that I was trying to find really came from either my training as a scientist, the ways I thought about the world or um, in terms of basic habits or examples from the natural world that reminded me that you know no matter how bad things seem right now they tend to get better yeah um that that became more of a a real genuine source of of spirituality for me of something larger a source of kind of comfort as well as as i try to convey a bit in the book just you know i guess to the theme of your show like some real life skills right i mean science Mm -hmm. if you let it teaches should teach us like how to how to accept what's really in front of us, not some story we want to construct in our heads. And that's better in the end. It, it, you know, it teaches us to be more comfortable with uncertainty. It teaches us to be curious and ask questions. And those are all really good, basic life-saving skills in hard moments. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. It almost sounds like you have blended in your unique um, form now of spirituality, if you will, if I could use that word just as a label into yeah. your science, mm-hmm. you've injected, if you would, um, 
and I, I'll use the term that you use in the book, wonder. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. I mean, wonder was a part of uh, things prior to these experiences <laughs> that you went through, Alan. But um, th- this is a this is a book, uh, and I think what you've accomplished here is uh, this book offers hope. Yeah. Uh, that even oh. Even, uh, even you, you, you faced a devastating thing in your family. You faced death times two. Uh, it, I, again, words don't even, I don't have the words. And yet, yeah. and yet, life carried on. Mm-hmm. Life, yep. life prevailed. The cycles of ordinary stardust continued to turn over. There you go. <laughs> yeah. 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 And I think that's incredible, Alan Townsend. I think that's absolutely incredible. And I'm, and I'm thankful for you to bring it to our attention in such a way. Yeah. yeah. Well, thank you both. I mean, I, I appreciate you bringing that part up because that was really a core intent is to try to, you know, I mean, to, to give people hope that might be going through this because because it's worth having and it's genuine. Right. And, um, and that's, that's a, that's something that I, I do hope people take away from it. Yeah. It's you've, you've written courageously, you've yes. written with genuinely heart. and with heart, this ordinary stardust, a, a scientist path from grief to wonder. And, uh, you got to get this book folks, wherever you buy books, Alan Townsend, this ordinary stardust will be back in a moment to wrap up our conversation today on Strategies for Living with Life Strategist, Alan Townsend. Be right back. You're going to see the difference. When you go to Azalea Cleaners, you'll hear about it too. Azalea Cleaners has been fine dry cleaning since 1958, plus laundry, alterations and repairs, comforters, wedding gown cleaning and restoration. You'll hear about it from your friends because they'll see it too. They'll notice the Azalea difference. Azalea is convenient. 732 Azalea Drive, 9220 Ellerby Road, and 9227 Mansfield Road, plus the front door of your home or business with Azalea's delivery on demand. Just text SETUP to 249-8283, and Azalea will pick up your clothes and deliver them back clean and fresh to you. You can't get closer than that. That's the Azalea difference. You'll notice it right away. Others will too. The Azalea difference. Fine dry cleaning since 1958. Text SETUP to 249-8283 and get the Azalea difference. AzaleaCleaners.com. Welcome back. Welcome back into 101.7 FM, 710 Keel. Welcome back into Strategies for Living. Uh, Lauren, Leon, McMillan, David McMillan. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it, 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 oh, man. Alan Townsend, This Ordinary Stardust, uh, A Scientist's Path through, through Grief to Wonder. Um, you wanna, yeah. If you want to connect more, and I hope you will, with mm-hmm. Alan, alantownsend.info is, uh, is a way to do that. Alan, what do you want to leave us with? here today on strategies what do you want people to take away from our conversation today and from this ordinary stardust you know i'm going to say this because we talked a lot about grief at the beginning and because the book started with with diana hoping it would help others if if you're listening and you're going through you're going through something really hard yourself um the basic advice actually works and um keep it simple and do the little things in your day that just open up a little curiosity, open up a little peace, take a little time for yourself. All of those things will actually help you get through. Um, and don't make the mistake I did in part. We, we tend to really turn inwards in these hardest times. Yeah. Uh, many of us do. And you need community around you. Um, mm-hmm. People want to help you, let them help you and, um, and you'll be better off. Yeah. Uh, so, um, you know, that's, I guess I would just leave it with that. Yeah, grief is an well invitation said. to. Yes, yeah, well said. Yeah. Grief is an invitation to reach out, even though we yeah, want to. Absolutely, we want to go in. Uh, this is a great book to do that. This mm-hmm. ordinary stardust, Alan Townsend, and you can find it wherever you buy books. AlanTownsend.info. dot info, and uh, folks, thank you, 
Thank you for tuning in to Strategies for Living to hear great life strategists like Alan Townsend. And we appreciate our sponsors making that possible. The Robinson Film Center and to say your cleaners and Pintail Roofing roof, roof. and Learning Rx and Hempress Cannabis with Love and the Shreveport Little Theater. If today, if today were the last day of your life, you only had one more phone call that you could make, who is it that you'd call? And what is it that you'd say? And why are you waiting? <laughs> make the call. For Alan Townsend and for Lauren Leon McMillan, I'm David McMillan. See you next time. Your own strategies for living. <laughs>